Thank you. Well, um, there might be a first in this particular presentation. It might be the only one that doesn't show a photograph of the TSR2 <laughs> in any form whatsoever. Um, I'm also going to avoid throwing cold water over the economics of this particular programme, as I usually would do with a great deal of relish. Uh, I'm certainly going to talk about the politics of the TSR2, at least aspects of the politics of the TSR2. I would contend, if, not, if this is not the most controversial of post-war British, British military aircraft, it's certainly one of the most political, from origins to its cancellation. So to some extent, it, it's what I'm going to leave out that's... Um, critical. I'm not going to talk about the technical stuff, which Tony has given us uh, a superb um, introduction to already. He's also teed up some of the underlying industrial questions, which I will focus on. He also hinted to some of the high, higher politics of TSR2, particularly the, the struggle in the early 1960s to keep the programme afloat, as it came under increasing pressure from the Treasury, for cancellation on cost grounds, and from the interesting duo of Sir Solly Zuckerman as chief scientist at the MOD, and what you might call his henchman, Lord Louis Mountbatten at the Admiralty. So I'm not going to talk about that stuff. I've got enough material just talking about the, the origins, of, and this might have been the, the, addition, the other title, the origins of the British Aircraft Corporation. Now, that actually is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, sig a significant and substantial story in its own right. But in a way, the TSR2 is one of the skeletal features of the formation of BAC in 1960-61. But it all comes about, and I will focus primarily on the, let's say, the, the industrial politics of, uh, of the programme, and what will be a, an interesting insight into the arm wrestling that went on between Wharton and Weybridge, um, which will become evident in, in, in a minute or two. But the broader context for this particular um, half an hour is very much the struggle that the United Kingdom government had to rationalise the aerospace industry in the 1950s and early 60s. Now, the... The Conservative government that came into power in 1951-52 inherited a whole programme of, of work on, on the aircraft industry. They also inherited an industrial structure that had been deliberately left in a fragmented state. Not because it was necessarily seen as, a, 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 as an economic advantage, but as a political or strategic advantage to have surplus capacity in the industry. But into the early 50s, into the mid-50s for sure, with tightening defence budgets threatening a whole raft of projects, which Tony did refer to this morning, which would culminate in the 57 Sandys white paper and the raft of cancellations through 56 and 57, there was considerable pressure on the aircraft industry to rationalise. The government was also in insisting that the civil side would fund itself from the profits of projects like the Viscount and hopefully projects like the Britannia and others. So, come the 1950s, come the, as the stirrings of OR339 begin to emerge, the government starts thinking about, we have too much capacity in this industry, it's too fragmented. We need to bring this industry closer together. Or as in the phrase of a, a, a civil servant, a senior civil servant at the Ministry of Supply, whom I did interview later in, in, in the 1970s, there were candidates for relegation in the industry. It was never said formally which of these candidates would be relegated, but it was evident that companies like Miles, perhaps Hunting, were vulnerable. There were standout candidates to, for survival. The Hawker Siddeley Group, although perhaps rather fragmented, someone described it as more or less like a, a very slow convoy floating along uh, on the basis of government contracts. But there were at least several others who were strong contenders for the new model of the British aerospace industry. And Vickers and English Electric were two of the clear favourites. Partly because they weren't just aircraft companies. The government was looking at the sheer economics of building aeroplanes, both military and civil. And larger industrial conglomerates 
who could feed in resources, both physical and financial, into the aircraft sector were seen as advantageous. And of course, Vickers, Vickers Armstrong was one of the stronger parts of the British defence industrial base. English Electric had a large set of interests out to trams and all sorts of stuff, not just the aircraft industry element, which it had picked up in 1944-45 as a new entrant into the business. Now, I'm not going to go down to the story of Wharton here. That's, a, uh, that's another speciality. But it is very much the case that English Electric were the new company on the block, at least in aircraft terms. And the very interesting heritage. I'm not talking about the civil side, although um, Vickers' ability to deliver airliners on time and on cost at this point would be a feature of the story. But look, the military stuff had pluses and minuses. I mean, the, the Vickers side, of course, the Valiant had been a very interesting contender as the, as the fourth V-bomber, later, a uh, later addition to the, the original series, as the interim aircraft that nearly met the original specification. So that swept the short prototype aside. A less successful beast was the Swift from Vickers Supermarine. Again, that is a procurement disaster of, a, of the highest order, which I think did set the um, Ministry of Aviation, Ministry of Supply and the Ministry of Defence against, to some extent, the Vickers design team. Set against this, of course, was the, was the new kid on the block, the first operational jet bomber, Britain's first supersonic fighter, backed by a research investment which was second to none. It, I think at the time, the English electric uh, um, wind tunnels and facilities at Wharton were as good as anywhere else in Europe. They were certainly on a par with those down at Farnborough. So you're dealing here with, as we get into the politics, the high politics of the, of the Industrial Coalition, these were the heavyweights. Uh, I know Tony's mentioned the, 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 the attractions of Hawker Siddeley and all the rest of it, but in terms of the image that the Ministry of Supply had, I'm not talking here about the AB, Air Ministry or the MOD, but the, the industrial sponsors, these were the two stars of the firmament. Now, how to get about, how to do the rationalisation? Well, this was... Oh, get ahead. It's also going to be the story of two men. One, a youngster, Freddie Page, the successor to Bill Petter at English Electric, who became the design, the, the, if you like, the project leader for um, English Electric at a very early age when Petter, for reasons that will become very important and relevant to this story, had to fill his very unique position. And of course, Sir George Edwards, who even then was a star of British aviation history. Somebody who earned his spurs during the war, and then, of course, as the, as the great project manager and leader of both Viscount and Valiant programmes. Very much a man of stature inside the Whitehall machinery. But you, you can see already the, the hints of, of, of what was going to come here. There would be a tension between what you could call the, new, the young pretender and the old stager, right from the outset to some extent. Because Page was not connected. He was the junior up there in the north. And even then, getting from, from, London to, from, from Preston to London was a bit of a struggle. And to some extent, you, you, you will see the next five or six years of the industrial story as a clash between Page and Edwards. But to the politics. How are you going to get this industry together? Some of them, you know, you had chaps here who'd founded the companies. Geoffrey de Havilland was still, was still, was still running his company. That's a friend, Hadley Page was running his company. And people like Edwards and, and others, who had earned their spurs as part of the wartime industry, were dominant characters. And the government of the day was not going to tell industry how to go about its business. It would nudge 
and edge the industry into stronger units. And that was a phrase used by Aubrey Jones in, in Parliament and to a select committee, that they would push the industry in directions that would be settled by industry itself. We're not going to sell that company to go with that company. They would come together naturally. But there could be a little bit of nudging and edging. And oh, I told a lie. There's a picture. How to actually get the industry moving well, without telling them how to do it? Well, you could use the contract mechanism. The single control that government had over money. He tried it with the Trident, or what became the Trident. But BEA and Hawker uh, uh, and de Havilland virtually told MOS where to go. And they went off in their own direction. The TSR2 OR339 was much closer to home. It was real cash controlled by the government, MOS, Air Ministry, whomsoever. In that sense, government, the civil servants, would be active players in determining the, 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 the outcome of the contract. And, and Tony has given us a very good description of the balance of technical interests that were at, in play at the time. But my fascination was, to some extent, was with the interplay of the two chosen parties of Vickers and English Electric. Because it wasn't an easy, to say the least, it wasn't an easy coming together of minds. And Tony, beautiful description of how, in a sense, the ministry favoured initially the Wharton experience and the Wharton designs and concepts. And there was a hint, was there not, that English Electric were going to have what in later language would be called design leadership or project leadership. But George Edwards recounts that having got wind of this, he beetles off to Whitehall to buttonhole his chums in the ministries. And he claims in his book, or at least a book written by Richard Gardner about his career, that he was able to arm wrestle control over the project away from Wharton. Now, there might well have been very good technical reasons why this is the case. And I think Tony in the panel might, might want to explore those. But there was extremely one very good reason why the Air Ministry would prefer a known quantity like Sir George Edwards in charge of the programme and his team rather than Freddie Page at Walton. And it all comes down to some extent to a well, an open secret in the industry about English Electric. That the Walton design team had been created in 1944-45 and they'd come up with these wonderful ideas. Some of them, of course, turned out to be fruitless. But they were a, a vital research oriented group of, of individuals. If anybody knows the, the structure of the Soviet aerospace industry, it was very much like that. The design bureau at Wharton with all the facilities, a bloody lovely runway, everything. But the hard knuckle stuff was down in the production works at Salmsbury, which was run by a tough old production manager called Arthur Sheffield, or Sheff as he was called at the time. Now, no photographs of him, I'm afraid, couldn't find one. But he had run the English electric, the old English electric plant, the Shadow Factory, during the war, as a superb manager, churning out the, the stuff that they were, um, they were contracted to do. I think it was Halifax bombers. And then later, they did subcontract work for de Havilland on the, on, on, on the Venom and Vampire. And as far as Sheffield was concerned, numbers counted. And the idea of producing this stuff out there at Wharton was just something that he could not understand and comprehend. And there was a, to, long story short, there was a huge tension, firstly between Sheffield and Petter, which had led to Petter disappearing to form, um, or to join Folland, and then between the whippersnapper Page and his team of, you know, pie-in-the-sky merchants at Wharton. And that was well known that the tension there could cripple 
the development and production of programs. I'm not even sure whether there were problems with the Canberra production that, were, that, it, that, it, that had actually generated or, or emerged as a result of that tension. But certainly Edwards knew perfectly well what was going on at Salisbury and Wharton. And he played on this like nobody's business. And I think that's according to Page's memoirs, uh, and the diaries are very much available at the National Aerospace Library, and I, and I edited them some years ago. He was convinced that the knowledge that Sheffield and he were at loggerheads was the wrong reason that, that Edwards was able to use to persuade the ministry to give Weybridge, in spite of it, mm, its iffy experience on Vickers supermarine side, of building combat aircraft other than large transport or large bombers. That's something I suspect that Tony and I might wish to debate. But that, in a sense, was the, the origins of the, of the particular form of development. And there was clearly tension between Preston, between Wharton and Weybridge. There was tension eventually over, over where the damn thing was going to be built, although, again, there was air ministry issues here as well, um, although this, this, goes up, this, this goes into the uh, post-BAC days. There's certainly... Um, Page's team felt that Wharton, with its open, open runway, access to easy, easy flights over the, over the Irish Channel, Irish Sea, was a much better place than Risley, Vickers' usual test site. In the event, the Air Ministry decided to push, take the whole f testing facility down to Boscombe Down, which to some extent was a, was a nonsense either way. But tensions like that, and certainly... Page's team at Wharton didn't have much respect for the people that were shoved in from Weybridge in terms of their ability to manage sophisticated supersonic aeroplanes like the TSR-2 design. They also felt, and Page's memoirs is very, very bitter about this, that Edwards' own success as a manager was promoting him away from the shop floor or rather the design, the design bureau, the design team, that as we moved into the late 50s, early 60s, it was what Page would call the second raters that were left in charge of the Vickers team running the programme out of Weybridge. That Edwards was off there in Whitehall defending what would become problems with the VC-10 and, and also the early days of what would become Concord after the mergers in 60, 6061. That's, in a sense, where the story begins to, to coalesce. You can step back and boo, if you wish. The man, of course, that wielded his axe in 1957, although, as we know, he wasn't entirely to blame for the raft of cancellations that took the, the soul out of uh, British military aerospace in that period. But he was keen, keen to speed up the process of rationalisation in 1960-61, inheriting this or nudging and edging from, um, from, from, from Jones, he was going to be a much more interventionist activist minister. There was some interest, of course, as, as, as BAC began to emerge from, 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 from Vickers and English Electric. By the way, de Havilland was also in the frame for this new company. Now, that would have been a really interesting what might have been, but put that to one side. There were certainly some hopes out at Wharton that the problems that Vickers were experiencing, which had really made them very malleable to Sandy's intervention, the primarily the problems they were having selling the Vanguard and producing the VC-10, would give them an opportunity to take control over the TSR-2 programme. Oh, in the event, uh, the Ministry of Supply said, no, too late. We're not going to disturb the managerial team at this point. Interestingly enough, in a sense, you could say from the formation of the British Aircraft Company in 1960-61, the tensions between Wharton and Weybridge began to ease, partly because <laughs> there was a common enemy. 
the British Treasury, and of course the coalition of anti-TSR2 sentiment that was building up in certain parts of the MOD. Uh, and Page and to some extent the, the, the Weybridge team also realised that it, this was a question of you know, holding together or being worked on separately. That they had to make this program work, and to some extent, it's the it's the it's the it's the problems of a hostile environment, a hostile political environment outside of the confines of the technology of the program, bad enough and difficult enough as they undoubtedly were and would have been. That was the melding of the BS, BAC team. It was also something that the chaps above the pay grade of, 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 um, of Page and even Edwards had agreed already that the BAC factory, the BAC system, would become one of the two major elements in 1960s British aerospace industry. And whatever programmes, whatever financial difficulties affected the original components of BAC, they would be put to one side to focus on common programmes that would be typical and would become the touchstone of the new company. And of course, the major item under discussion was the TSRT development. That, I think, was the only one of the original BAC programmes that was officially a BAC programme. Um, the VT-10 and the Lightning, they were kept separate on the accounts of BAC in the early days. So to some extent, therefore, we, we finish up with the, all the elements of a, a good Shakespearean tragedy. <laughs> that the two protagonists over five, three or four years had finally found romance, a willingness to work together to produce what they hoped would be a very fine aeroplane for the, for the RAF. But out there, of course, were, to keep using rather colourful language, the gathering storm of political and economic criticism. And certainly, uh, Tony has referred to the advent of the Labour government in 1964-65 as the critical turning point. Um, I'm not so sure whether TSR2 would have survived a, a defence review for an incoming Conservative government in 64-65 so, in either. I think the basic economics of the, of the programme were against, I think, a happy outcome. But we certainly know that the end of the story is abrupt, brutal. It was the product, to some extent, of, uh, of some successful negotiations that Dennis Healy, the Ministry of Defence, would claim in Washington when he says he got a very good deal from the Americans to buy the F-111. Too bloody right he got a good deal from the Americans. Because even if the TSR-2 was still a, 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 a prototype, the United States would fear obvious competition. So they got, did get a damn good deal, on condition, of course, that TSR-2 would see the, the scrap heap. So in a sense, that's the, that's the, the, the industrial tale. I mean, out of the... <laughs> And I will use the word tragedy of TSR2, although as a, as a political economist, I think it was a, a program that deserved to be cancelled in many, many respects. Out of that, of course, comes a, a jewel in the crown of, of British military aerospace. There is a victim, by the way. I would say hunting, hunting Luton is the one clear victim of the TSR2 cancellation. Hunting had been swept up into British Aircraft Corporation. And it had two very interesting designs, one for a strike trainer, the other for a, a, a short haul, short medium haul airliner. They would become very successful products for new BAC as the Provost and the 111. Um, Luton got closed and turned into a housing estate. So Wharton and Weybridge, to some extent, survive another day. Weybridge, in the end, is not so successful. It becomes the civil outfit of BAC, and the story of Airbus and BAC 2 and 311 is well known. Way, um, Wharton, of course, goes on to triumph. 
as the major design centre for UK military aerospace into the, late, into the late 60s, early 70s and beyond. And that famous phrase, I'm from Wharton, I'm here to help, becomes part of the tapestry of British military aerospace. But it's a coalition that had a difficult origin but I suspect, in a sense, it gave the BAC team and Freddie Page in particular, who would go on to, in a sense, be, take, uh, take control of what will later become British Aerospace's aircraft operation. It became, in a sense, a good prototype for working with the French and the Germans and the Italians, and the Spanish. You could say TSR2 was the first example of industrial collaboration between two competing nations, one in Lancashire and one in Surrey. <laughs> and there you are, gentlemen. Keith, Keith has uh, finished a little early, so we do have a couple of minutes uh, if you have any questions for him uh, immediately. So, I'm throwing up Darcy's To what extent do you see the uh, complexity, the increases in complexity on design and development and all the things that we've seen over the last decades as another driver in the removal from sort of cottage industry type uh, elements in the industry into a, into a conglomerate that can handle the big research uh, issues? I think yes, but it was a, it was a, it was a slow motion exercise. Again, I, I, I'm not I, 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 I hesitate to get too deeply involved in the technology, uh, but I think um, the the advent of the the, the the avionics and the electronic fits that were becoming increasingly complex into the 1960s, I think were the with a with a driving force of much of the cost escalation we'd see in later programs, in the. I think in the late 50s, it was much cruder economics about industrial scale and scope. That the ministry just felt that our industry was just too fragmented to, to, to survive in the face of not just American competition, but they also had an eye to what was happening across the channel with the emergence of a much more dynamic and government-determined deter, government industrial strategy for its aircraft industry. Compare and contrast the nudging and edging with the French ability to intervene directly to force companies to adjust their ownership structures, their managerial structures, to suit a national concept. I mean, it wasn't quite Dassault and what become Dassault and Aerospatiale, but by late 50s, early 60s, Dassault was emerging as the clear national champion for French military programs, Sodavation, Nordavation for large transports and commercial aircraft. And that would become much more evident into the, 19, into the 1960s, with determinant French governments intervening to shape national champions. But I think initially it was really about just getting British industry in a rough shape in order to compete on a, on a evenish terms with the Americans and their European competitors. Um, thank you very, very much. Uh, the human element is so often what's forgotten, isn't it? Thank you. Um, how much was um, revolving doorism a factor in the relegation um, supremacy companies, but also in the designs? Um, and I'm not using revolving door in any pejorative sense, but obviously XREF people moving into the big companies. 
Was that an issue then? I don't know. I don't think, it's, it, I don't think it was then the issue that it has become yeah. later. Um, again, I, I suspect Tony might have a better insight into, the, into the, the nature of the design teams. But I think both Vickers and English Electric had military advisors, and you can see them in the files, and you can see them uh, references to them in, 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 in company um, minutes. But broadly speaking, this is a question of civil versus military. The Air Ministry and the RAF were one set of, uh, uh, of people, clearly distinct from the, um, the people working in industry. An interesting hybrid, I think, were the people at Farnborough who would act as, in, uh, would act as uh, technical advisors to the ministry. Uh, only I suspect, and I haven't really delved into this in any great detail, they also had their own axes to grind which may have influenced their particular view of, of, of emerging project. But I'm not going to go down that road because I don't know. I haven't looked in the files. Okay.